It often appears good business for such an enterprise to acquire an existing company in the field it wishes to enter rather than to start a new venture from scratch. In order to make such acquisition possible, and to obtain acceptance of the deal by the required large majority of shareholders of the smaller company, it is almost always necessary to offer a price considerably above the current level. Such corporate moves have been producing interesting profit-making opportunities for those who have made a study of this field, and have good judgment fortified by ample experience. A great deal of money was made by shrewd investors not so many years ago through the purchase of bonds of railroads in bankruptcy, bonds which they knew would be worth much more than their cost when the railroads were finally reorganized. After promulgation of the plans of reorganization a when issued market for the new securities appeared. These could almost always be sold for considerably more than the cost of the old issues which were to be exchanged therefore. There were risks of non-consumer of the plans or of unexpected delays, but on the whole such arbitrage operations proved highly profitable. There were similar opportunities growing out of the breakup of public utility holding companies pursuant to 1935 legislation. Nearly all these enterprises proved to be worth considerably more when changed from holding companies to a group of separate operating companies. The underlying factor here is the tendency of the security markets to undervalue issues that are involved in any sort of complicated legal proceedings. An old Wall Street motto has been, never buy into a lawsuit. This may be sound advice to the speculator seeking quick action on his holdings. But the adoption of this attitude by the general public is bound to create bargain opportunities in the securities affected by it since the prejudice against them holds their prices down to unduly low levels. The exploitation of special situations is a technical branch of investment which requires a somewhat unusual mentality and equipment. Probably only a small percentage of our enterprising investors are likely to engage in it, and this book is not the appropriate medium for expounding its complications. Six Broader Implications of Our Rules for Investment Investment policy, as it has been developed here, depends in the first place on a choice by the investor of either the defensive, passive, or aggressive, enterprising, role. The aggressive investor must have a considerable knowledge of security values, enough, in fact, to warrant viewing his security operations as equivalent to a business enterprise. There is no room in this philosophy for a middle ground, or a series of gradations, between the passive and aggressive status. Many, perhaps most, investors seek to place themselves in such an intermediate category, in our opinion that is a compromise that is more likely to produce disappointment than achievement. As an investor you cannot soundly become half a businessman, expecting thereby to achieve half the normal rate of business profits on your funds. It follows from this reasoning that the majority of security owners should elect the defensive classification. They do not have the time, or the determination, or the mental equipment to embark upon investing as a quasi-business. They should therefore be satisfied with the excellent return now obtainable from a defensive portfolio, and with even less, and they should stoutly resist the recurrent temptation to increase this return by deviating into other paths. The enterprising investor may properly embark upon any security operation for which his training and judgment are adequate and which appears sufficiently promising when measured by established business standards. In our recommendations and caveats for this group of investors we have attempted to apply such business standards. In those for the defensive investor we have been guided largely by the three requirements of underlying safety, simplicity of choice and promise of satisfactory results, in terms of psychology as well as arithmetic. The use of these criteria has led us to exclude from the field of recommended investment a number of security classes that are normally regarded as suitable for various kinds of investors. These prohibitions were listed in our first chapter on p. 30. Let us consider a little more fully than before what is implied in these exclusions. We have advised against the purchase at full prices of three important categories of securities, one, 
foreign bonds, 2. Ordinary preferred stocks, and 3. Secondary common stocks, including, of course, original offerings of such SUs. By full prices we mean prices close to par for bonds or preferred stocks, and prices that represent about the fair business value of the enterprise in the case of common stocks. The greater number of defensive investors are to avoid these categories regardless of price. The enterprising investor is to buy them only when obtained. Able at bargain prices, which we define as prices not more than two-thirds of the appraisal value of the securities. What would happen if all investors were guided by our advice in these matters? That question was considered in regard to foreign bonds. On p. 138, and we have nothing to add at this point. Investment grade preferred stocks would be bought solely by corporations, such as insurance companies, which would benefit from the special income tax status of stock issues owned by them. The most troublesome consequence of our policy of exclusion is in the field of secondary common stocks. If the majority of investors, being in the defensive class, are not to buy them at all, the field of possible buyers becomes seriously restricted. Furthermore, if aggressive investors are to buy them only at bargain levels, then these issues would be doomed to sell for less than their fair value, except to the extent that they were purchased unintelligently. This may sound severe and even vaguely unethical. Yet in truth we are merely recognizing what has actually happened in this area for the greater part of the past 40 years. Secondary issues, for the most part, do fluctuate about a central level which is well below their fair value. They reach and even surpass that value at times, but this occurs in the upper reaches of bull markets when the lay sons of practical experience would argue against the soundness of paying the prevailing prices for common stocks. Thus we are suggesting only that the aggressive investor recognize the facts of life as it is lived by secondary issues and that they accept the central market levels that are normal for that class as their guide in fixing their own levels for purchase. There is a paradox here, nevertheless. The average well-selected secondary company may be fully as promising as the average industrial leader. What the smaller concern lacks in inherent stability it may readily make up in superior possibilities of growth. Consequently it may appear illogical to many readers to term unintelligent the purchase of such secondary issues at their full enterprise value. We think that the strongest logic is that of experience. Financial history says clearly that the investor may expect satisfactory results, on the average, from secondary common stocks only if he buys them for less than their value to a private owner, that is, on a bargain basis. The last sentence indicates that this principle relates to the ordinary outside investor. Anyone who can control a secondary company, or who is part of a cohesive group with such control, is fully justified in buying the shares on the same basis as if he were investing in a close corporation or other private business. The distinction between the position and consequent investment policy of insiders and of outsiders becomes more important as the enterprise itself becomes less important. It is a basic characteristic of a primary or leading company that a single detached share is ordinarily worth as much as a share in a controlling block. In secondary companies the average market value of a detached share is substantially less than its worth to a controlling owner. Because of this fact, the matter of shareholder management relations and of those between inside and outside shareholders tends to be much more important and controversial in the case of secondary than in that of primary companies. At the end of chapter 5 we commented on the difficulty of making any hard and fast distinction between primary and secondary companies. The many common stocks in the boundary area may properly exhibit an intermediate price behavior. It would not be illogical for an investor to buy such an issue at a small discount from its indicated or appraisal value on the theory that it is only a small distance away from a primary classification and that it may acquire such a rating unqualifiedly in the not too distant future. Thus the distinction between primary and secondary issues need not be made too precise, for, if it were, 
then a small difference in quality must produce a large differential in justified purchase price. In saying this we are admitting a middle ground in the classification of common stocks. Although we counseled against such a middle ground in the classification of investors. Our reason for this apparent inconsistency is as follows. No great harm comes from some uncertainty of viewpoint regarding a single security, because such cases are exceptional and not a great deal is at stake in the matter. But the investor's choices between the defensive or the aggressive status is of major consequence to him, and he should not allow himself to be confused or compromised in this basic desi scion. Chapter 8 The Investor and Market Fluctuations to the extent that the investor's funds are placed in high-grade bonds of relatively short maturity, say, of seven years or less, he will not be affected significantly by changes in market prices and need not take them into account. This applies also to his holdings of U.S. savings bonds, which he can always turn in at his cost price or more. His longer-term bonds may have relatively wide price swings during their lifetimes, and his common stock portfolio is almost certain to fluctuate in value over any period of several years. The investor should know about these possibilities and should be prepared for them both financially and psychologically. He will want to benefit from changes in market levels, certainly through an advance in the value of his stock holdings as time goes on, and perhaps also by making purchases and sales at advantageous prices. This interest on his part is inevitable, and legitimate enough. But it involves the very real danger that it will lead him into speculative attitudes and activities. It is easy for us to tell you not to speculate, the hard thing will be for you to follow this advice. Let us repeat what we said at the outset, if you want to speculate do so with your eyes open, knowing that you will probably lose money in the end, be sure to limit the amount at risk and to separate it completely from your investment program. We shall deal first with the more important subject of price changes in common stocks, and pass later to the area of bonds. In Chapter 3 we supplied a historical survey of the stock market's action over the past hundred years. In this section we shall return to that material from time to time, in order to see what the past record promises the investor, in either the form of long-term appreciation of a portfolio held relatively unchanged through successive rises and declines, or in the possibilities of buying near bear market lows and selling not too far below bull market highs. Market Fluctuations as a Guide to Investment Decisions Since common stocks, even of investment grade, are subject to recurrent and wide fluctuations in their prices, the intelligent investor should be interested in the possibilities of profiting from these pendulum swings. There are two possible ways by which he may try to do this, the way of timing and the way of pricing. By timing we mean the endeavor to anticipate the action of the stock market, to buy or hold when the future course is deemed to be upward, to sell or refrain from buying when the course is downward. By pricing we mean the endeavor to buy stocks when they are quoted below their fair value and to sell them when they rise above such value. A less ambitious form of pricing is the simple effort to make sure that when you buy you do not pay too much for your stocks. This may suffice for the defensive investor, whose emphasis is on long pull holding, but as such it represents an essential minimum of attention to market levels. One. We are convinced that the intelligent investor can derive satisfactory results from pricing of either type. We are equally sure that if he places his emphasis on timing, in the sense of forecasting, he will end up as a speculator and with a speculator's financial results. This distinction may seem rather tenuous to the layman, and it is not commonly accepted on Wall Street. As a matter of business practice, or perhaps of thoroughgoing conviction, the stockbrokers and the investment services seem wedded to the principle that both investors and speculators in common stocks should devote careful attention to market forecasts. The farther one gets from Wall Street, the more skepticism one will find, we believe, as to the pretensions of stock market forecasting or timing. The investor can scarcely take seriously the innumerable predictions which appear almost daily and are his for the asking. 
yet in many cases he pays attention to them and even acts upon them. Why? Because he has been persuaded that it is important for him to form some opinion of the future course of the stock market, and because he feels that the brokerage or service forecast is at least more dependable than his own. We lack space here to discuss in detail the pros and cons of market forecasting. A great deal of brain power goes into this field, and undoubtedly some people can make money by being good stock market analysts. But it is absurd to think that the general public can ever make money out of market forecasts. For who will buy when the general public, at a given signal, rushes to sell out at a profit? If you, the reader, expect to get rich over the years by following some system or leadership in market forecasting, you must be expecting to try to do what countless others are aiming at, and to be able to do it better than your numerous competitors in the market. There is no basis either in logic or in experience for assuming that any typical or average investor can anticipate market movements more successfully than the general public, of which he is himself a part. There is one aspect of the timing philosophy which seems to have escaped everyone's notice. Timing is of great psychological importance to the speculator because he wants to make his profit in a hurry. The idea of waiting a year before his stock moves up is repugnant to him. But a waiting period, as such, is of no consequence to the investor. What advantage is there to him in having his money uninvested until he receives some, presumably, trustworthy signal that the time has come to buy? He enjoys an advantage only if by waiting he succeeds in buying later at a sufficiently lower price to offset his loss of dividend income. What this means is that timing is of no real value to the investor unless it coincides with pricing, that is, unless it enables him to repurchase his shares at substantially under his previous selling price. In this respect the famous Dow theory for timing purchases and sales has had an unusual history. Briefly, this technique takes its signal to buy from a special kind of breakthrough of the stock averages on the upside and its selling signal from a similar breakthrough on the downside. The calculated, not necessarily actual, results of using this method showed an almost unbroken series of profits in operations from 1897 to the early 1960s. On the basis of this presentation the practical value of the doubt theory would have appeared firmly established, the doubt, if any, would apply to the dependability of this published record as a picture of what a Dow theorist would actually have done in the market. A closer study of the figures indicates that the quality of the results shown by the Dow theory changed radically after 1938, a few years after the theory had begun to be taken seriously on Wall Street. Its spectacular achievement had been in giving a sell signal, at 306, about a month before the 1929 crash and in keeping its followers out of the long bear market until things had pretty well righted themselves, at 84, in 1933. But from 1938 on the Dow theory operated mainly by taking its practitioners out at a pretty good price but then putting them back in again at a higher price. Finally 30 years thereafter, one would have done appreciably better by just buying and holding the Dow Jones Industrial Average.2. In our view, based on much study of this problem, the change in the Dow theory results is not accidental. It demonstrates an inherent characteristic of forecasting and trading formulas in the fields of business and finance. Those formulas that gain adherence and Importance do so because they have worked well over a period, or sometimes merely because they have been plausibly adapted to the statistical record of the past. But as their acceptance increases, their reliability tends to diminish. This happens for two reasons, first, the passage of time brings new conditions which the old formula no longer fits. Second, in stock market affairs the popularity of a trading theory has itself an influence on the market's behavior which detracts in the long run from its profit-making possibilities. The popularity of something like the Dow theory may seem to credit its own vindication, since it would make the market advance or decline by the very action of its followers when a buying or selling signal is given. A stampede of this kind is, 
of course, much more of a danger than an advantage to the public trader, buy low sell high approach. We are convinced that the average investor cannot deal successfully with price movements by endeavoring to forecast them. Can he benefit from them after they have taken place I.T. by buying after each major decline and selling out after each major advance? The fluctuations of the market over a period of many years prior to 1950 lent considerable encouragement to that idea. In fact, a classic definition of a shrewd investor was one who bought in a bear market when everyone else was selling, and sold out in a bull market when everyone else was buying. If we examine our chart I, covering the fluctuations of the Standard & Poor's Composite Index between 1900 and 1970, and the supporting figures in Table 31, p. 66, we can readily see why this viewpoint appeared valid until fairly recent years. Between 1897 and 1949 there were 10 complete market cycles, running from bear market low to bull market high and back to bear market low. Six of these took no longer than four years, four ran for six or seven years, and won the famous new era cycle of 1921-1932 lasted 11 years. The percentage of advance from the lows to highs ranged from 44% to 500%, with most between about 50% and 100%. The percentage of subsequent declines ranged from 24% to 89%, with most found between 40% and 50%. It should be remembered that a decline of 50% fully offsets the preceding advance of 100%. The Investor and Market Fluctuations 193 Nearly all the bull markets had a number of well-defined characteristics in common, such as, 1, a historically high price level, 2, high price, earnings ratios, 3, low dividend yields as against bond yields, 4, much speculation on margin, and, 5, many offerings of new common stock issues of poor quality. Thus to the student of stock market history it appeared that the intelligent investor should have been able to identify the recurrent bear and bull markets, to buy in the former and sell in the latter, and to do so for the most part at reasonably short intervals of time. Various methods were developed for determining buying and selling levels of the general market, based on either value factors or percentage movements of prices or both. But we must point out that even prior to the unprecedented bull market that began in 1949, there were sufficient variations in the successive market cycles to complicate and sometimes frustrate the desirable process of buying low and selling high. The most notable of these departures, of course, was the great bull market of the late 1920s, which threw all calculations badly out of gear. Even in 1949, Therefore, it was by no means a certainty that the investor could base his financial policies and procedures mainly on the endeavor to buy at low levels in bear markets and to sell out at high levels in bull markets. It turned out, in the sequel, that the opposite was true. The market's behavior in the past 20 years has not followed the former pattern nor obeyed what once were well-established danger signals, nor permitted its successful exploitation by applying old rules for buying low and selling high. Whether the old, fairly regular bull and bear market pattern will eventually return we do not know. But it seems unrealistic to us for the investor to endeavor to base his present policy on the classic formula I.T. to wait for demonstrable bear market levels before buying any common stocks. Our recommended policy has, however, made provision for changes in the proportion of common stocks to bonds in the portfolio, if the investor chooses to do so, according as the level of stock prices appears less or more attractive by value standards. Formula Plans In the early years of the stock market rise that began in 1949-50 considerable interest was attracted to various methods of taking advantage of the stock market s cycles. These have been known as formula investment plans. The essence of all such plans except the simple case of dollar averaging is that the investor automatically does some selling of common stocks when the market advances substantially. 
In many of them a very large rise in the market level would result in the sale of all common stock holdings, others provided for retention of a minor proportion of equities under all circumstances. This approach had the double appeal of sounding logical, and conservative, and of showing excellent results when applied retrospectively to the stock market over many years in the past. Unfortunately, its vogue grew greatest at the very time when it was destined to work least well. Many of the formula planners found themselves entirely or nearly out of the stock market at some level in the middle 1950s. True, they had realized excellent profits, but in a broad sense the market ran away from them thereafter, and their formulas gave them little opportunity to buy back a common stock position. There is a similarity between the experience of those adopting the formula investing approach in the early 1950s and those who embraced the purely mechanical version of the Dow theory some 20 years earlier. In both cases the advent of popularity marked almost the exact moment when the system ceased to work well. We have had a like discomforting experience with our own central value method of determining indicated buying and selling levels of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The moral seems to be that any approach to money making in the stock market which can be easily described and followed by a lot of people is by its terms too simple and too easy to last. Spinoza's concluding remark applies to Wall Street as well as to philosophy, all things excellent are as difficult as they are rare. Market fluctuations of the investor's portfolio Every investor who owns common stocks must expect to see them fluctuate in value over the years. The behavior of the Dow Jones Industrial Average since our last edition was written in 1964 probably reflects pretty well what has happened to the stock portfolio of a conservative investor who limited his stock holdings to those of large, prominent, and conservatively financed corporations. The overall value advanced from an average level of about 890 to a high of 995 in 1966, and 985 again in 1968, fell to 631 in 1970, and made an almost full recovery to 940 in early 1971. Since the individual issues set their high and low marks at different times, the fluctuations in the Dow Jones group as a whole are less severe than those in the separate components. We have traced through the price fluctuations of other types of diversified and conservative common stock portfolios and we find that the overall results are not likely to be markedly different from the above. In general, the shares of second-line companies fluctuate more widely than the major ones. But this does not necessarily mean that a group of well-established but smaller companies will make a poorer showing over a fairly long period. In any case the investor may as well resign himself in advance to the probability rather than the mere possibility that most of his holdings will advance, say, 50% or more from their low point and decline the equivalent one-third or more from their high point at various periods in the next five years. A serious investor is not likely to believe that the day-to-day -day or even month-to-month -month fluctuations of the stock market make him richer or poorer. But what about the longer term and wider changes? Here practical questions present themselves, and the psychological problems are likely to grow complicated. A substantial rise in the market is at once a legitimate reason for satisfaction and a cause for prudent concern, but it may also bring a strong temptation toward imprudent action. Your shares have advanced, good. You are richer than you were, good. But has the price risen too high, and should you think of selling? Or should you kick yourself for not having bought more shares when the level was lower? or worst thought of all should you now give way to the bull market atmosphere, become infected with the enthusiasm, the overconfidence and the greed of the great public, of which, after all, you are a part, and make larger and dangerous commitments? Presented thus in print, the answer to the last question is a self-evident no, but even the intelligent investor is likely to need considerable willpower to keep from following the crowd. It is for these reasons of human nature, 